All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, my name is Tiffany Hansen. Um, I am an outreach and engagement manager with Luna Language Services. We are a translation and interpretation company located here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we provide services to both uh, local, national, and global clients, and we offer our services in over 200 languages, including American Sign Language, as you can see here with our interpreter, Becca. We do host regular public education events about language access. Um, our goal is to help companies to ensure their information, resources, and um, opportunities are accessible and inclusive to community members from all language backgrounds. And we have a strong partnership with the EEOC um, because of the work that we do with American Sign Language Services. We do work heavily in the disability inclusion space. So I approached Brian about hosting a webinar focused on ADA compliance and reasonable accommodations where Luna could contribute our subject matter expertise on some best practices for working with our deaf and hard of hearing community members. So first, we will kick off this webinar with Brian Shoemaker. He is the Outreach Education Coordinator for the Indianapolis District of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, he'll be providing us with some key ADA compliance issues to watch for, as well as suggestions for reasonable accommodations in the workplace. Then I'll be introducing my colleague, Betsy Payne, to share her personal experience with us as a member of the deaf community. Uh, suggesting accommodations for the deaf and hard of hearing community, and also pointing out some best practices for creating an inclusive workplace for deaf and hard of hearing people. If you have any questions at all throughout the event, please submit those using the Q&A function. If we have time at the end, I'll be sharing some of those questions with our speakers. With that, uh, let's get started with Brian. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm going to just um, I'm gonna spotlight my video here so you can see me um, and go ahead and share my screen here in just in a second. OK. All right. Um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you, uh, Tiffany. It's always nice to be here in partnership with Luna. Uh, my name is Brian Shoemaker. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Indianapolis District. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ADA and specifically reasonable accommodations. I have my name and my phone number. Um, well, and my I guess my email address as well. So please feel free if you need to, uh, you know, write that down. And um, you can certainly use that at any time um, you like and uh, to ask me any kind of questions at all. I am going to be talking again about the ADA and um, reasonable accommodations. I'm going to be doing compliance stuff. It's going to be the boring stuff, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we will have Betsy here and she's going to do a wonderful job. I think she's going to be more interesting than me. So if you can get through my compliance issues, you're going to have a really great webinar here um, at the end. Um, and again, we'll have any questions you can always ask me either in the chat or um, not in the chat, but in the question Q&A, or you can just give me an email directly. So real quick about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, the EEOC was created in 1964. Uh, it was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We opened our doors in 1965. And it deals with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which deals with employment discrimination. And that's what the EEOC does. We deal with employment discrimination. We are a federal agency. We have offices all across the country. Uh, the Indianapolis district is all of Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, and in the western part of Ohio. And so I wanted to do is really briefly touch on some of the laws that we enforce. And so I've kind of listed them here on my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, on the screen, you can see some of them. Some of them you might recognize right away and know exactly what they do. Some of them you may not have heard of before, or if you just read them, you might not know exactly what they do. I think it's sometimes hard and difficult to understand what all these laws mean if you're just looking at them from kind of far away, if you're just looking at their titles. 
I think it's an easier way or a better way to understand what the EEOC does if we take all those laws, kind of distill them down into what are they trying to do? And what they're trying to do as far as the EEOC is concerned is um, look at employment discrimination. And so there are certain protected basis that is unlawful in employment to discriminate against. So you cannot discriminate in employment against certain protected basis, and they are race, color, disability, which we'll talk about today, genetic information, religion, national origin, sex, which includes pregnancy, and age 40 and older. So we're gonna move right along to the ADA and reasonable accommodations. The ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, okay? It was amended, it was first created in 1990, it was amended in 2008. And a lot of times when people say the Americans with Disabilities Act, it can be nerve wracking because it is a expansive law. There's a lot in it. And so what I hope to do today is by focusing on reasonable accommodations, I'm hoping that we can make it a little bit easier for you to understand for both employers and employees, what are the basics? What, what are gonna be the guide points of this uh, federal law that we need to keep in mind? And one of the best ways to think about this is to ask the correct question. Okay, so if nothing else, I'm giving you all the answers up front. I'm giving you my main presentation here right now. If nothing else you take away from this uh, program today, keep in mind, we, what we want to do is ask the right questions, ask the correct questions. And the correct question that we want to ask for reasonable accommodations is, can this person be accommodated? Not, does this person have a disability? Okay, so the question that we always want to ask is, can this person be accommodated, not does this person have a disability, and we'll find out a little bit more uh, as we talk. I do, just for compliance reasons, and make sure that we're on the same page, I do want to briefly talk about Title I of the ADA, which is the definition of disability. We talk about uh, what is a disability in Title I of the ADA. Title I is about employment discrimination. And so we need to talk about it a little bit first. Um, Title I basically says an employer cannot discriminate in any aspect of employment against an inst individual with a disability who is qualified. And so we're going to break that down in just a bit um, and find out what that exactly means as we move on a little bit today. Again, today's focus is going to be reasonable accommodations, and Title I of the ADA also includes a requirement, and that's a requirement now, to provide a reasonable accommodation to a person with a physical and or mental limitation, okay? So providing a reasonable accommodation is a requirement of the ADA. So let's talk about the ADA and what the definition of a disability is, just so we're on the same page. We talk about a three-pronged definition, Today, I'm going to be talking about only the first prong, because that's the prong, well, prong one and two both relate to uh, reasonable accommodations, but really prong one is when you think about reasonable accommodations the most. And prong one of that definition, okay, is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. Now, there's a lot going on in there, and so we're going to break it down just a little bit. Um, prong two is a record of an impairment and prong three is regarded as. We're not gonna talk about record of or regarded as today. So the first hurdle we wanna overcome is this impairment, this idea of a physical or mental impairment. And so what are we talking about? It's either a physiological disorder or condition that sometimes is the physical part, okay? Or a mental or psychological condition or disorder. And that's kind of the mental part of it, right? The question we wanna ask is how the impairment, this physical or mental impairment will affect a major life activity compared to most people in the general population, okay? So those are the two things we're thinking about as far as impairments are concerned, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits major life activity. So what are major life activities? Well, there are many, 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 many major life activities, okay? I've listed some here, things like reaching, grabbing, sitting, seeing, hearing, the ones that you would normally think of as major life activities. But I do want you to keep in mind that major life activities can be things like reading or concentrating or thinking, okay? These deal more with those mental um, uh, limitations or impairments rather than some of the more physical impairments that we generally think of right away when we think of a disability, okay? Now, I'm not done yet. Major life activities also include major bodily functions, 
Okay, so things like immune system or uh, normal cell growth, if those things are limited or impaired in a way, as if you compare them to the general population, those are also uh, considered um, major life activities that could substantially limit a, a substantially limit someone. Okay. So we want to keep this in mind as well. Okay. Uh, major life activities can be all those things that we normally think of sitting, standing, reaching, thinking, concentrating, but they're also major bodily functions as well. And the reason why I keep kind of going back to this idea of what is the question we want to ask? The question is not, does this person have a disability? The question is, can I accommodate this individual? is because the very last part of this definition that we want to talk about is substantially limits. And in 2008, when the uh, ADA was amended, Congress really kind of set out to explain, you know, why it amended it and, and what is now included. And the main takeaway of this is that substantial limitation shall be construed broadly and in favor of expansive coverage. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this uh, from, uh, you know, and from expansive coverage of individuals. Extensive analysis is not required. The primary focus should be on the person's qualifications for a job, the need for a reasonable accommodation, or whether discrimination occurred. That's the focus. That should be your focus as well when you're thinking about uh, disability. Can this person be accommodated? Can I accommodate this person? Not necessarily, uh, is this person, does this person have a disability? Okay. And lastly, just to keep us on the same page, um, you know, old school thinking, you know, when I was first came in the commission 20 years ago, we were thinking about duration as part of this, uh, you know, this equation of whether or not someone has a disability. It was amended in 2008. So we no longer want to think about, um, you know, that there's a minimum duration. Okay. So an impairment, you know, physical and mental impairment, if it lasts less than six months, it could still qualify, okay? It still could be substantially limiting. And so we want to keep that in mind as well. So again, the best question to ask is, can I accommodate this individual when we're thinking about reasonable accommodations? Not necessarily, is this person uh, disabled? So we've got the first part, an individual with a disability. We know now what did that, that means. Then we talk about the qualified section. And this should be pretty, pretty easy. What does qualified mean? Well, it means that the person has to have the required skills in order to do that job. They have to have this experience necessary for that job, the education necessary for that job, any other job-related requirement, the qualifica qualification standards that's necessary for that job. Okay, so that's the first part. And that's pretty easy. The second part is when we get into reasonable accommodations. They have to be qualified in the sense that they have the right skills, okay, and experience necessary, but they also have to be able to perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation, okay? So that's important. We need to be able to, if there are essential functions of the job that a person can do with an accommodation, that person is qualified for that job. That's why reasonable accommodations are so important. They allow people to be qualified for jobs. So what is an essential function, okay? Think about essential functions of a position that are fundamental job duties. These are job duties that must be, be, uh, be able to be performed in order to accomplish that job function. Okay, so you want to think about what is that employee actually required to perform? What do they need to do in order to do that job? And what's the consequences of not performing that function? If there are no consequences or if the employee doesn't necessarily need to do that particular function in order to get the job done, that function may be a marginal function. Okay, they're less important functions. And it's important to know the difference because when we think about reasonable accommodations, Essential uh, functions of the job cannot be eliminated, but marginal functions can as a reasonable accommodation, all right? So it's important to know what's essential to this job and what's marginal. And kind of a, you know, a compliance issue hint or when, if you're gonna be thinking about this for compliance reasons, think about what the job does, okay? Not necessarily how it's done. So if part of the uh, you know, uh, essential functions of this job is to move 100, pound box from one department to another. All right. Okay. Think about how one would do that. Not necessarily that it has to be done by someone lifting and carrying it uh, to, the, to the spot. Instead, think about how do you accomplish that goal? 
does someone have to be able to lift hundred pounds in order to do the essential functions? Or can they use maybe a, a trolley? Can they use a hand uh, a cart? Something like that, that will be able to assist them and move that. The essential function just may be able to get it from one place to the other, not being able to lift hundred pounds. So that's one thing we wanna think about. All right, so now we get into the, um, you know, the uh, why everybody's here today, reasonable accommodations. And reasonable accommodations, remember, they're required by law, okay? The ADA, sa the ADA says that you need to provide an, a reasonable accommodation to either a job applicant uh, or an employee with a disability so that they can do the essential function of the job or so that they can apply for a position, all right? Employers can also not deny an employment opportunity to a, uh, an individual because they need a reasonable accommodation. All right, so this is important. Those two factors are very important. You're required to, to provide one and you can't deny somebody an opportunity if they need one, okay? So what is a reasonable accommodation? It can be any device, a change of work environment, an exception to policy or practice. A lot of times we just think about tools and devices, but think about reasonable accommodations also as ways to change a policy or practice, okay? Um, now I've been doing, you know, I've been with the EEOC for 20 years and I don't know every single accommodation out there. All right. So I wouldn't expect anybody to know, but there are really good resources out there uh, that can help you. And so I always suggest that if you're stuck, if you're in a situation where somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I need a reasonable accommodation, you know, you can brainstorm. Sometimes you got to think out of, outside the box, but it's also good to get some help. And that help can be in the form of maybe a local advocacy group, okay? Maybe there are some community groups in your area where you can reach out and have a conversation with them. Maybe they're advocates for uh, the, the disability that you're trying to accommodate and they can help you in ways that you may not have thought of before. Uh, the Job Accommodation Network is also a really great resource. Um, they know, I'm always fascinated about how much information they have at their fingertips if you're looking to be able to provide a reasonable accommodation for somebody. Um, and even local groups like Easter Seals, I know we have Easter Seals Crossroads and they're extremely helpful as well. So you should be thinking about, you know, when you're looking to, to see if you can find a reasonable accommodation for somebody, you should be thinking about not only thinking outside the box, but these other groups to help you. Because I guarantee as far as, as, far as a compliance issue is concerned, if that ever gets to the EOC, that investigator is going to call Jan or Crossroads Easter Seals or a local advocacy group and say, hey, is there an accommodation for this individual? Okay, they're going to look at, um, to see if this person can be accommodated as well. So you should do that up front. So what are some examples? This is an exhaustive list. There are many, many, many different types of uh, reasonable accommodations for individuals. Um, like I said, the ones we think of most often are the, the devices, the assistive technology, the sign language interpreters, the you know, physical modifications to the workspace. Those are the things we think of most often. But modified work schedules can be an accommodation. Making exceptions to policies is certainly a reasonable accommodation that you need to consider. Job restructuring, you know, eliminating those marginal functions. That's why it's important to know what's essential and what's marginal. Eliminating those marginal functions, that can be a reasonable accommodation. Changing supervisory methods, not changing supervisors, but the way that supervisor communicates with employees may need to change, okay? Um, having a job coach is great. Telework, we now know that telework is, can be very useful and that may be a reasonable accommodation. And leave, I talked about leave as well, providing more leave, okay, or allowing a person to take leave, those can be um, and should be considered for reasonable accommodations. And then finally, what we consider accommodation of last resort is reassignment to a vacant position, okay, moving that person from a position where they cannot do the essential function of job to a position that's vacant, that they can do the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. Now, there are some things that are not reasonable uh, accommodations. And so lowering production standards or performance standards, that's not uh, a reasonable accommodation, okay? Removing an essential function, not a reasonable accommodation. The whole point of an accommodation is to make sure that person can do the essential functions of the job. So you certainly wouldn't have to remove an essential function of the job. A company doesn't have to monitor an employee's use of medication. They don't have to provide medical or personal items for that individual. You don't have to change somebody's supervisor, but you might have to change the way that supervisor communicates with their employees. 
And then really anything that would uh, result in an undue hardship for that employer. Now, undue hardship is a word that we hear, we hear all the time. You probably have heard that as well. And an undue hardship and reasonable accommodation is that, of course, a reasonable accommodation is required by law unless the employer can show, and it's up to the employer to show, that there is undue hardship. So what does an undue hardship mean? An un undue hardship is what's called an affirmative defense. It means that, in fact, we have an accommodation that would allow this individual to do the essential functions of the job, but we as an employer cannot provide that accommodation to that individual because it's going to be a significant difficulty or expense for us. Significant being the key word, okay? So if an employer can show that this accommodation, if we provide it to this individual, it's going to cost us a significant amount of money. Okay, or it's going to change the very for medical information if it's job related and consistent with business necessity. And normally, the reason why you're doing that is because you're talking about a reasonable accommodation issue, or maybe there's a, a production issue or performance issue. And during your uh, your review with that individual, you learn of a medical impairment or a mental or physical impairment that's gonna substantially limit a major life activity. And suddenly now you have a conversation with a reasonable accommodation. So uh, just a few quick things before I hand it over. Um, some best practices. Make sure you're reviewing job descriptions with actual job requirements. This is important with essential functions of the job. I can't tell you how many times employers use job descriptions that were made 20 years ago. The job, the current job has changed. And what was important 20 years ago is not necessarily a, an essential function currently. So make sure that when you're talking to uh, potential uh, employees or applicants, that you know what exactly are the essential functions of that particular job and that, that it matches with what that person is ex will be expected to do, okay? Ensure everyone in the, in the hiring process is aware of reasonable accommodations. That goes from the HR people to the managers, the frontline supervisors, to the front desk person that's going to be receiving all these applications, okay? That person needs to understand if someone, an applicant comes to them and says, hey, I need an accommodation in order to complete this application, that that front desk person doesn't just say, I don't know what you're talking about. We can't do that, okay? They have to know at the very least that, oh, this person's asking for something. Let me get my supervisor. Okay, and maybe we can then have a conversation about reasonable accommodation to complete the hiring process. All right, be able to articulate the non-discriminatory reason the person was selected. That's important. It's something I shouldn't have to say, but um, it is something for compliance reasons. You should be able to say why you selected somebody. Okay. Um, Make sure that you're applying the selection criteria developed before the interviews. You don't want to go into an interview just, you know, and kind of wing it. All right. You want to have criteria beforehand so that if there are questions um, and that, you know, you know what the essential functions of the job are, you can explain what that person would have to do in that particular job. Okay. Know what criteria you're looking for so that you can select the best qualified person for that job, whether they have a disability or not. Okay, you're looking for the best qualified individual um, and use a diverse hiring panel. That kind of leads, if you have a diverse uh, hiring panel, it helps with this group think that sometimes can occur. It helps with some stereotypes or, um, that people might have. And so we wanna make sure that we have the you know, really diverse hiring panel uh, to have different ideas and ways of looking at uh, individuals that are coming in as your job applicants. And of course, be compliant for, with federal law. Don't ask questions that would be illegal. Don't, if it's a pre-employment or, or if it's a job application or a, um, a job applicant, a hiring interview, you do not want to be asking questions that would elicit medical information. You can ask and say, here are all the essential functions of the job. Are you able to do the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation? And they can say yes or no. Community partnerships are extremely important and helpful. I, you know, I always highly suggest like make 
inroads within your community. There are lots of good groups out there, business advocacy groups, um, you know, disability advocacy groups, other types of advocacy groups out there. And by making partnerships and forming partnerships with those groups, it can be helpful to your company. Not only does it break down barriers uh, to employment, but then when issues arise in your uh, workplace, you have partners already that you can reach out to that may have the skills necessary to solve those problems. And the last thing I want to leave you on before we get into Betsy, which is one much more interesting part of the presentation, is confidentiality. Anytime you get medical information from an employee, that medical information has to be kept confidential. It should be kept in a separate file away from the personnel files. And that is just the compliance issue. And you want to make sure that you are doing that within your own company. And again, um, you know, here is some information about me, uh, my contact information. If you have questions, please feel free to give me a call. And it doesn't matter where you're located in the United States. If I can't answer the question, I'll send you the person who can. Um, my email address, please feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to um, point you in the right direction if I can't answer your question uh, specifically. So thank you for your time. I am now going to hand this presentation back over to Tiffany and uh, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm going to put Betsy up here too. Here we go. Um, so I just want to apologize one for some of the te technical difficulties <laughs> that I'm having today. Um, we did have captioning available. Uh, everything in the settings is correct. And for some reason, that function is not showing up for me today. So we will have captioning provided on the YouTube recording that we will be sending out later. So I promise that will be in effect. Um, I also, for some reason, my computer just decided to randomly restart. So we'll have just a little bit of a break in the recording. But Brian, if you're okay with it, can I share your slide deck with everyone publicly after the event? Um, I think so. Let me get let me get back with you on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, but I think so. I think it'll be okay. So hopefully we'll make sure that all of the information is available to you all after the event. Um, so let's move on to our next segment with Betsy Payne. So I have the honor of working with Betsy here at Luna Language Services. Uh, she was born deaf and uses American Sign Language as her native and preferred language. Uh, Betsy currently works as a language coordinator here at Luna, managing a very large contract with the state of Indiana. Um, she's great with numbers and actually recently earned a promotion to our accounting department. Congratulations, Betsy. Um, now Betsy's going to share with you some of her own personal work experiences as a deaf community member in the workplace along with some of her suggestions for best practices for creating an inclusive workplace for deaf and hard of hearing um, community members. So take it away, Betsy. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you, Brian, as well for your presentation. Again, my name is Betsy. And as Tiffany mentioned, I was born deaf and I am second generation. So I was mainstreamed in elementary school until I went to the Indiana School for the Deaf. So my experience before I joined Luna, I worked at the Center for Independent Living and I worked there for almost six years. So my experience with accommodations at my previous employer was a little bit iffy, it didn't go well. I did not have full access to the conversations and the meetings, especially during the all staff meetings. So I would have to sit there and try to gauge and figure out what was going on using lip reading, which was a lot of mental work for me, trying to figure out what I was catching, what I was missing. So I'd have to take a lot of notes and then go up to somebody after the meeting to try to get that clarification on what was going on and then they would have to fill me in. And that's how I got by with that job. After I came here to Luna, my accommodation experience was vastly different than before. It improved, I felt like I had access, I had uh, connections and relationships with other staff and I really cherished that experience. 
So right now, I want to go ahead and explain what are some of the best accommodations for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And I want to explain that it's really important for the staff to know that there is another deaf individual in the office and they need to be aware of that. Because if they're not aware, they might seem more rude or they might come up to us and try to engage us and think we're ignoring them just because we can't hear them. So it's just vital that the other staff members know that the employee is deaf and how to interact and engage with them. So I do have one funny story I wanted to share with you again, just based on my experience. And I've worked at Luna for almost three years now. And I was recently in the staff meeting, taking notes on something. And another staff member came up to me and said, hello. And again, she's hearing. And she kept on saying hello to me. But again, I couldn't hear anything. I was too busy writing notes. And, and it wasn't until a couple of minutes later, she started cracking up because she realized I was deaf. And at that point, the whole entire staff started crackling as well. So it just need to make sure that the staff are more aware of how to interact with somebody who is deaf. And I also want to explain different techniques you can use to get a deaf employee's attention. You can go ahead and tap them on their shoulder in neutral space, tap at the table, just try to get their attention. Um, don't touch them in a place that's not uncomfortable. Make sure it's in a neutral space. Um, make sure they feel comfortable in which the area you're touching them. Um, you can come up to a deaf person, but try not to come directly behind them because you might face the chance of startling them. So it's better to come at them at an angle when the, you're in their peripheral view so they can still you see you coming and they don't get startled as easily because again, that's something that can happen. So just come from the side, come from direct long, just come from that peripheral angle. So another approach that you could use is sending an email, a chat, a text to your coworker. That is one approach. If you feel like you can't talk to them in person, don't know how to really engage with them, you can always send them some sort of electric communication, electronic communication, and that's another good option that you could have. I think the most important approach that you guys could take on is ask your employee what's their preferred way to get their attention, their preferred communication mode. I think it's always dependent on what they need. And again, the needs of one deaf individual and one hard of hearing individual, it really does depend on their hearing level and their hearing loss. Some people are born deaf, some become deaf later in life. So um, some people might have diseases that deafness is a side effect or a result of. So it really depends on their experience and when they became deaf. So it's all of that information really plays into what the accommodation needs. So what one person needs might be vastly different than what another employee might need. So again, it's always best to ask them. And I just feel like I wanna emphasize that piece of information, ask them what they need, and they'll be more apt to tell you what works and what does not work. And then never assume, oh, because it works for one employee, it will work for the other. That's not always the case. For example, I do have a coworker who's hard of hearing. She identifies as hard of hearing and I identify as deaf. She became hard of hearing later in life while I was born deaf. So her needs are different compared to mine. So I require an interpreter all the time for any meeting or any one-on-one -on -one communication. And she typically does not rely on the interpreter most of the time. She'll only request an interpreter for large group meetings or large staff events. For one-on-one -on -one interaction, she can understand just fine. So again, it depends on what our needs are. Some deaf individuals can speak, some are great at lip reading. So again, it's important to listen to what their needs are and try to figure out how you can accommodate them. I never want anybody to minimize their feelings. It's important that we listen to their needs because they will tell you what they need to be successful. 
So accommodations and workplace environments, it could be providing VRI, video remote interpreting, or virtual interpreting, where an interpreter connects through uh, some sort of virtual platform. You could use that for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, or like the interpreter is joining the webinar today, that's a virtual interpreter. So we have accommodations there and ready for people to use. Um, having ASL interpreters on site if needed, that can always be provided. You could use CART, which is captioning real time. So there would be a live individual who is actually typing everything that is being said. So whatever a hearing individual says, the cart writer would actually type it out. So for example, it's similar to closed, cap closed captioning. So if somebody's late and deaf or doesn't understand sign language, you can have captioning and cart available for those individuals. So our, there are so many different types of accommodations, whether it be providing interpreters or cart that could work. Sometimes a deaf or hard of hearing individuals struggle to work in noisy environments. So they might ask to be placed into a quieter environment where there's less background noises. Sometimes just hearing those background noises can add an, another layer of distractions and stress on the employee. But sometimes being in a more peaceful environment will help. Um, another example would be is for um, if a person has Meniere's disease. So that is a disease where a hearing person will be fine one day, does not require any accommodations, and then out of the blue will wake up the next day with no hearing or drastic hearing loss. So when that typically happens, the individual is diagnosed with Meniere's disease. So they'll need accommodations. They might need interpreters or cart writing. And again, this might be a temporary accommodation until their hearing comes back because with their disease, hearing and the levels of hearing can fluctuate. So we don't want anybody to ever say, oh, well, you used to need this accommodation and now you don't need it. Or you didn't need an accommodation previously and now you do. So really accommodations can fluctuate and change depending on their hearing level that day. So, for example, there might be somebody who has a physical impairment who for a day or two is not able to walk, but afterwards can walk fine for a couple of weeks and then need that accommodation again. This is the same accommodation. We don't want to be treated differently because of that fluctuation. We want to make sure that deaf and hard of hearing can carry out their duties. If they can't do their job or if they don't have the accommodations, it's important for agencies and businesses to provide them so they can carry on and do their daily tasks. Some uh, employee agencies are requiring individuals to fill out accommodation forms. Once those accommodations forms are filled out and submitted, then the businesses are providing the accommodations. And that can be a little bit harsh. It's somehow you need to develop an honesty system where you can trust the person to fill out the accommodations that they need and then provide them for whatever window of time, whether it be 30 days until they can get that medical form and get that information up, uh, submitted. Because sometimes it is hard to be able within that time frame they give us to set up a doctor's appointment, get the verification, submit all the paperwork to HR. Sometimes having that time restraint put on us is very stringent and it's hard for us to do. So if you can have that honor system, it's a little bit better. And another issue with that as well is we're having to pay for that medical appointment to prove our disability out of pocket. So that's another hardship put on to us. So I'm just asking for a little leniency. Most audiologists um, are very expensive and insurance doesn't always cover audiological appointments. Another best practice for developing an inclusive work environment for deaf and hard of hearing individuals 
is making sure that those employees feel included. It doesn't matter what's going on, make sure that they feel that sense of inclusion. So for example, if there are weekly announcements and all of the staff gathers around or whatever, make sure that those deaf and hard of hearing employees have access to it. It could be an email recapping all of the announcements. If you send weekly video announcements, make sure you have captioning available so we can watch and see what's going on as well. You can't just kind of use this PA system and announce everything, especially when you have employees there that can't hear. So make sure you try to build an environment of inclusion and you're not dismissing some of your staff. If you have a video that has no captioning or does not have the ability to be captioned, go ahead and write a transcript that you can send out to those employees. So again, we can have that equal access that the other staff is having. Another good thing that would do is if you have hearing staff who know how to sign, go ahead and take advantage of that. You can have them have a dual role for that company. And again, that would help you save a lot of money because you won't have to hire interpreters for every appointment, every meeting, every announcement. If you have staff on the standby that can come and serve as an interpreter if needed. For example, here we have many employees around who are hearing and I am the only one who is deaf. So if there's a meeting or there's a last minute announcement, I can call one of my coworkers to interpret briefly. So if somebody needs to come up to me, we have somebody ready that I can use. And that's really all it takes. And it can be that simple as an approach. And that having that dual role individual will be a benefit for a company. You can use them to work with the deaf and hard of hearing staff. And I just, again, I feel like that would be a great impact and a gain for the company. You can always be creative to find a way to make things work for your deaf and hard of hearing staff need. But please do not make decisions for them. Always refer to them and ask them what they need. And we'll tell you, we can always work together to find a solution. It's important that businesses be creative. And especially with all the technology we have, it's become a lot easier. So for accessibility in regards to technology, I strongly recommend that the IT department at the company become knowledgeable and have training with different uh, accessibility tools. For example, um, a deaf individual might have a video phone that has to connect and integrate with the company's phone system for phone and call transferring and routing. So for example, I can help other coordinates answer phone calls if needed. Of course, there's a little bit of lag time because it has to go through the interpreter, but I have the ability to take calls and answer calls and help the other staff if needed. So I suggest that the IT department becomes aware of how to use that technology because that's something that typically happened is we're burdened with trying to figure out solutions and how to get everything set up and how to integrate it with our agency system. And that's just another task that's being put onto us when it should be on the IT department who knows all this stuff, who knows how to use the systems when we sometimes don't. So not everyone knows how to do that. And you can train the IT to become more proficient in AT is by contacting Easter Seals Crossroads. They can provide training on different accessibility tools and technology to best provide accommodation for the deaf of hiring employees or other disabilities as well. They provide resources for all disabilities. We have devices that provide captionings for phone calls. So deaf and hard of hearing individuals can still speak on the phone, but read the captions that are presented on their screen. So that's another good opportunity as well. We have video phones that we can use. Um, there are smoke and fire alarms that have lights. So if something happens at your place of employment, it's important that the deaf and hard of hearing employee knows what's going on so they can evacuate the building safely.
Um, there are strobe lights for doorbells that can be installed. For example, there is a new technology called Square Glow and it has a light that flashes. So when you're in the office or in your personal home, and I actually learned about this new feature myself recently, and it does seem like it'd be a great benefit to the deaf and hard of hearing community that you can turn this square glow on if you're going into somebody's office just to give them a heads up that you're there and to get their attention. So I, in my role, typically use the video phone and I have one here at work. It's just easy for me to interact and make calls with other people that way. If you're using a Zoom meeting and other virtual platforms, make sure accessibility is provided, either using CART, captioning, or getting an ASL interpreter. Live captioning is typically a lot better. If you use on the software captioning, it's not always accurate. So using a live CART writer increases the accuracy of the writing. And again, it always boils down to ask what the deaf employee wants. What is their preference for accommodations? One struggle we're facing right now in the deaf community are masks. A lot of employees and a lot of facilities still use masks. When I'm here in office and I'm not at my desk, I am required to use a mask. So anytime I have to go to the bathroom or if I'm getting something out, or if I'm going to have a meeting with a coworker, I need to wear a mask. But once I sit down at my desk, I don't have to. But because people have masks on, it's a lot harder for me to gauge them and try to figure out what's going on. So it's important to have that interpreter there. But again, I strongly suggest having clear masks available for employees. So if an individual lip reads, they will still able to have that communication or you'll be able to read facial expressions. When a mask is on an individual, we are missing a lot of vital grammatical information. The human face and our facial expressions, there are 40 different muscles in our face. I'm not sure if you guys realize that. So there's 48 different muscles and those muscles can produce over 10,000 different kinds of facial expressions. And that's how a lot of deaf individuals figure out and pick up body language and cues are using those facial expressions. So not everything is shown on the hands. And by wearing masks, we're taking away a lot of that vital information. So it's harder for us to understand if somebody's mad or if they're upset or what the point of this whole conversation is. So by wearing masks, that's causing a little bit of oppression. So if you wear those clearer masks, or even face shields, we're able to grasp all of those nuances that are seen on the face. And again, it's just important that everybody feels comfortable. The bottom line is, again, ask the deaf and hard of hearing employee what they want. What are their needs and how can you accommodate them so they can do their job? You can't just assume that something will work for them you don't wanna minimize their feelings or their experiences. So it's important to ask what they need and to actually listen. And that will help you really improve uh, the job duties. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. Let me bring Brian back down here too. All right, so we have a lot of great questions, both in the Q&A as well as in the chat. Um, and we have just about five minutes left. So I'm gonna ask just a few questions um, until we hit our one o'clock mark. Uh, so one thing that came up and maybe Brian and Betsy, you could both contribute to the answer to this was around, um, let, let's see, wouldn't it be an EEOC violation in assuming that the associate needs an accommodation or wouldn't it violate the associate's HIPAA or privacy? Essentially, one, legal, legally, how do you ask someone if they need uh, an accommodation? And then maybe Betsy, you can contribute to good ways in which people approach you about that without making assumptions. 
So I'll, I'll start first. Um, you don't want to make an assumption that someone needs an accommodation. The employee is the one, it's their responsibility to come to you uh, to ask for that accommodation. Now, usually, like I said, what ends up happening is there's some sort of performance issue because there's an accommodation in a perfect world. What would end up happening as soon as an employee uh, knows that they have an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, they would go to HR and they would say, hey, this happened and now I, you know, I need to start talking about having a reasonable accommodation. And that would be perfect in a perfect world. What normally ends up happening is an individual has some sort of um, need for an accommodation, but they don't say anything because they don't think it's a big deal. They continue to work and there's a performance issue because they can't do the essential functions of the job, okay? And then that's when you start having that conversation. So um, you as an employer do not want to just be going and asking, hey, do you need an accommodation? If now, however, if there is a, um, a time where you can see someone is clearly having an issue on the job because of uh, you know, one of these, um, uh, visible disabilities. So it's not a hidden disability. disability. It's, it's obvious or a, a visible disability. Then you could have that conversation because you can witness it. It's, object, it's, um, it's objective. You can see what's, what's happening and you can see that the employee is having issues. You might want to have a conversation at that time, but you never want to assume that someone needs an accommodation. Okay. Have that employee. It's the employee's responsibility to talk to you about that. And then Betsy, maybe you could contribute to maybe a great way to an approach an employee about asking them if they need support or if they need an accommodation without making assumptions. So I agree with what Brian said because some deaf and hard of hearing individuals like to keep their disability private. Uh, they don't like to advertise that they have this going on. So it really is up to that individual to let HR know. And it is their responsibility to request some accommodations, but it's HR's responsibility to let the higher ups know what the game plan is and what the accommodations need and make sure that employees needs are being met. Um, for coworkers, for example, if I let my coworker know I need some accommodations, it, it's nice for me to be able to share that with them because that coworker as well can ask that for me. So I typically share that information with other individuals as well. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Betsy, one suggestion you also mentioned to get someone's attention is to, to touch them lightly, but touch can be a very sensitive thing, especially in the workplace. Uh, one question that came up is where is a good place to touch someone that won't cause any problems um, to, or like a good way to get their attention if you don't want to physically touch them? Okay, that's a good question. So like a neutral space, um, typically we tap on the shoulder or on the arm right here, just right within this general vicinity, that would be considered a neutral space that you could tap somebody. I would say the legs are a no-no region, the backs do not touch. I would say just right here on the arm. And if you're very uh, leery of touching, you could always tap on the table. We'll kind of feel that, get that startled and try to figure out what's going on. Um, you could tap your leg. I don't know how loud that would be. So, but if you want to avoid touching a person, you could tap your leg, tap the table as other options as well. Thank you. And we'll do one more question. Um, Brian, does the EEOC utilize a formula for evaluating significant financial hardship? Um, there is typically a struggle with employers in their interpretation of this cost versus the EEOC's cost, any insight? Yeah, I get that a lot. And what I would, what I would suggest is that if you're gonna use the, you know, say this is an undue hardship, I can't provide this accommodation because it's gonna cost too much money. Um, you know, show the EEOC the analysis that you made in coming up with the fact that this is in fact gonna cost you too much money, okay? Um, you know, show us how you came up with that result. It's the defense of using the undue hardship, the employer needs to be able to show why it in fact is a significant cost. And so by all means, please tell the, tell the uh, 
the EOC make that argument for this is going to cost us too much money because of X, Y, and Z, and here's the evidence that would show it. That's extremely helpful to, to us when we're, when we're trying to figure out, you know, is this going to be a significant hardship? Because we're just going to be looking at the, end, the information you provide. If you don't provide any information, and I call up Jan and say, how much is this, you know, going to cost? And Jan says, oh, it's about 500 bucks. I don't know if that's going to be too significant or not. So you want to be able to make sure that if you're going to make that argument, undue hardship because of an expense, show us why it's a significant cost for the company. That's give us the paperwork. That's that's the most important thing. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Brian and Betsy for sharing all of this valuable information. Um, there were tons more questions uh, that we didn't we didn't get a chance to get to because of time today, but I'm so glad that everyone is so interested in learning more about this topic. I'll be sending out a follow up email to everyone who registered to the event. Um, Brian and Betsy's contact information will be included in that email, so you can reach out to either or both of them directly if you have any if you want to propose any of those questions to them and get some more information. Um, with that, thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our ASL interpreter, Becca. Um, have a great day, and we hope to see you at another training soon.